Well, hi, I'm Betsy Reese. I'm the marketing coordinator at Children's Hospital and Medical Center. Welcome to Parenting You. Um, I've already told you about the phones and the restrooms. Our speaker tonight is Leanne Fidito. Leanne has 25 years experience working in pediatric and adult GI. I would try to say gastroenterology, but that's good. Um, and she does work in children's GI clinic. Please help me welcome Leanne Fidito. Thanks. Good. <laughs> Hi, thanks for uh, coming tonight. Hopefully this will be uh, maybe stuff that you already know or reinforce, but certainly here for questions afterward if you have questions or concerns. Um, Betsy uh, introduced me as working in the GI clinic, and indeed I do. And I would say many of the patients I see uh, present with constipation and most of the time have been through their primary care physician um, or nurse practitioner or such and really have not made good progress or success and so that's why they come to the clinic. So I guess I would say maybe the population or the kids that I see are maybe a little more skewed towards you know, having more difficult problems to treat. Um, but I wanted to share just some basic principles and um, uh, theories for management of this problem. So what is constipation? You know, that's the first thing. I think that it's important that people understand the definition because, uh, you know, everybody, there are people that believe that if you don't have a stool every day, you're constipated or, or if there's a lot of straining. And all those things do play a role. And you can see from the list here that this is kind of what comprises the uh, medical textbook definition of constipation. And then this is just kind of a normal um, uh, flow chart of how many stools we should expect in uh, children that are um, infants, six months to 12 months, and then thereafter based on whether they're breastfed, formula fed, et cetera, et cetera. You can see the trend is we start out having more stools, and as we get older, we have less stools. And another term that I wanna uh, define for um, here at the beginning is fecal impaction, and that is lack of a bowel movement for several days, weeks, and you get this large compacted mass of stool that builds up in the rectum that cannot be easily passed. And symptoms of this um, include not going, obviously, and when, they find, when the poor child finally does go, it's very painful for them. They often complain of rectal discomfort. Um, it's distressing and probably the underlying cause of chronic constipation issues begin here. And what is encopresis? We heard, we've heard this term before as well, and this just means soiling. This means that there is leakage of the poop into the underwear that's unintentional. Um, at times the child may actually sense that it's happening, and at times they might not even know that it's happening. And I'll talk a little bit more about why they may not sense it uh, as I progress here. So constipation is really a common problem. Um, there are a variety of reasons why children get this, and I, I'll kind of touch on that as we go on here. But up to 10% of children are thought to suffer from constipation at one time or another. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it develops into a chronic issue for all children, but it certainly can. And these, this is just more uh, statistics to share with you about four to seven year olds. About a third of them are constipated at one time, 5% are primary school children. Usually constipation or the, the basis of chronic constipation starts when a child is potty training. During that process, um, there, there can be some um, pitfalls, it can be behavioral, it can be actually that the stools are tend to be large and hard and painful and a child decides at that point in time it's really not a very fun thing to do to have a bowel movement and so they kind of learn this new behavior withholding which can lead to the chronic issues. This is just a diagram of the large intestine and um, in looking at this here um, you can see that there's the rectum and the descending colon. The transverse colon goes across the top of the abdomen and then it ends on the right side of the abdomen where it connects into the small bowel. 
This is the reservoir for stool collection. This, the primary job of the colon is to collect the stool and to reabsorb the water that's in the stool. Um, otherwise, we would have electrolyte um, issues and dehydration. But this can be um, the, the problem with the child is, is that as longer the stool sits there, the harder it gets, the more water that's absorbed, and thus more difficult to pass. So signs and symptoms, what are we looking for? Probably less than three bowel movements a week um, in a child over three years of age. Um, probably they would be having more bowel movements a week if they're younger than three years of age. As we talked about earlier, as we grow older, we have less stools. Pain, straining, um, it actually may appear that they're trying to push the stool out, but in essence, they may actually be trying to hold it in. It can be, very, it can be a very confusing thing. They may have actual withholding behaviors that you can see where they go into the corner when they need to have a bowel movement or um, they crouch down, those kind of typical um, withholding behaviors. And so how does it start? It usually starts, as I said, when the bowel movements aren't frequent enough, the stool gets um, compacted into the bowel, it gets dried out over time, um, it's maybe a painful bowel movement that hurts and can actually cause a little tear, or what we call fissure. And with this going on, um, children don't want to go. And this behavior just kind of perpetuates itself. So what are risk factors? Well, dietary factors. Um, obviously, fluids are good. Um, and so, you know, drinking water and other such is good. Uh, I would caution a little bit in the fact that we, we don't like to overdo on the juice because especially in toddlers it can have the reverse effect of you know causing looser stools uh, because of the sugar load in the juice. Holding in the stools because they're painful, changes in their daily routine, i.e. they start preschool, they go to daycare, whatever it might be, not enough exercise. Uh, if constipation runs in the family, certainly can be uh, more predominant in your child. And there are certain medications, although I can't probably touch on all of those, but um, there are some uh, key medications that we would be concerned about. So this is a pictorial of what painful stools feel like for children and uh, uh, their um, need for avoidance. Now dietary factors, I'm just gonna now touch on all of the, the risk factors in the list. Of course, I talked about drinking enough water, fiber. Um, sometimes fiber, I would say fiber in moderation is good. If you overdo the fiber, sometimes if they have a tendency towards constipation, you may actually worsen the condition because as the stools bulk up, if they don't have, let's say, um, active motility or motility that's normal, they may tend to have slow passage of stool and then when bulking up the stools, it may slow it down even more. So how do we know where to go on that line? I would say a normal amount or a moderate amount of fiber is good in the diet. Drinking too much milk um, can make toddlers feel full, particularly at that age group, and not want to eat anything else. And it's not necessarily the milk that causes them to get constipation, but moreover the fact that they fill up on the milk and they don't want to eat other foods that might per, um, promote healthy elimination. Bottle-fed babies are much li more likely to get constipation issues than breastfed babies, and just because of the makeup of the milk. Behavioral uh, factors, um, when a child puts off the need to go to the bathroom, they're too busy playing, they aren't near a toilet, uh, whatever it may be, then as they once again get into the pattern of holding, it can um, lead to uh, painful stools and such. Changes in vacation, we probably as adults can all relate to the going on vacation, um, staying with people that you know we normally don't stay with, whatever it may be, can contribute to their um, bowel pattern if it's certainly not part of their routine. Cognitive issues can lead to constipation, meaning you know if there's some developmental delays, if they're not ready for potty training, um, attention deficit certainly can play a role. Uh, even when it's treated, uh, sometimes those children are not um, 
responsive to the need to go in and have a bowel movement, uh, sensory spectrum disorders, those kinds of things. And other situational issues that could play a role in constipation include that of um, the, the time that they were toilet trained, if there was some coercion going on at that time, if for whatever reason they developed this fear of the toilet, um, uh, bathroom avoidance, sexual abuse, and such. Lifestyle changes, lack of physical activity, and we live sort of in a computer uh, handheld game environment um, world, I should say. And, uh, you know, kids are not active as they used to be. They're not outside running and playing and getting the normal physical activity that tends to help the bowels move more regularly. And as I talked about, the family uh, history can play a role. Medications, as it, the list is much longer, but this is um, common medications that we know cause, can lead to constipation. Um, iron supplements, for instance, if you're given a multivitamin with iron, that might be a little bit constipating. Antihistamines, as we go into allergy season, might um, um, precede the constipation. Anti-seizure medicines, and uh, you can see the others as listed here. So, um, you know, most of constipation is related to what we would call a functional uh, problem, which means that the function of the bowel and the child's um, normal passage of a bowel movement is affected not because of other medical cause. About 5% after we do the workup will be found to have another medical cause. So by and far and large, it's usually related to um, toilet sitting, uh, potty training, withholding, large stools, that whole uh, process that kids go through. And so when do you seek medical help? You know, all kids as adults will get constipated from time to time, and if you're able to, you know, overcome it and move on, it's probably not a, a huge problem. But if it's something that continues to linger or you run it, start running into the problems of leakage of stool in the underwear, um, abdominal pain, those kinds of things, uh, it probably is time to go and um, have your child evaluated. And this is just a list that's comprised of um, symptoms or signs that we would be concerned about. In a baby, they may be more irritable. Uh, if your child doesn't want to eat much, and then you notice after they finally do have a bowel movement, they're more eager to eat, but now, um, you know, it's going a week and they're not having a bowel movement and they're pushing back on eating. You know, that will definitely affect their growth and development, so we need to address that. Poor weight gain, soiling their clothes, which, as we all know, can really present problems when kids get to preschool and school age. Um, bleeding with the passage of stool, which may only be related to a small tear or cut on the outside, but it's always something that should be um, maybe not investigated with further tests, but at least investigated with your physician in discussion. Uh, feeling sick, a lot of these children will complain of a lot of stomach pain, discomfort, cramping, those kinds of things. So what's the investigation? Um, investigation really um, comes down to um, how long this has been a problem, how much impact it's been having on their life, and if there's any other kind of concerning factors that we bring out when we're seeing you and your child. Um, I won't read through all of these questions because I have several pages of them, but these were questions I put in for you all just so that you um, have a reference to sort of thinking things through if you're planning to see your physician or your um, primary care provider that this could be uh, helpful information for them. Um, it's good if you have the opportunity before you go in to keep track of their bowel movements for a couple of weeks. Uh, whether it's in a notebook on a little calendar, just documenting whether they're soft or if they're loose and how many times a day and or if they're having accidents in their underwear, how many times that's happening because it gives um, a good history and foundation for uh, what needs to be done. Uh, also, it's good to know if they're having pain when they're passing these stools. If so, you know, really it's appropriate to look at the anal area to see if there's any obvious tears or problems of that nature. Um, uh, and if they're having stomach pains related. 
once again, more um, questions for you to think about when seeking medical attention. And then I wanted to touch on a few of the, I would say, common problem, medical problems, although I want to stress that these are not common. But these are things that we might look for if um, the constipation persists despite our normal treatment. And the first would be Hirschsprung's, and this is a disease that typically um, um, comes about or is discovered early on in infancy. What happens is, is there's um, a portion of the bowel where there's lack of nerve cells present, which causes basically an obstruction of the flow of the stool through the colon. It's um, more predominant in uh, males, and it can run in families, 10% uh, tendency for families. And so from this picture here, you can see that um, in the rectum, sorry, this is not working. In the rectum, and as you go up into the sigmoid colon there, there's some kind of constriction related to the lack of what we call ganglion or the nerve cells there, which kind of impedes the flow of stool out of the bowel. Usually, as I said, this tends to um, be identified fairly early on. Uh, these children typically don't pass that kind of first meconium stool in the first 24 hours when they're in the hospital. That's kind of the first red flag, and then uh, stooling becomes a, a predominant issue, you know, in their first days of life to their first months of life. Uh, chronic constipation can um, uh, be prevalent, obviously. Many times they present with these kind of thin, pencil-like diameter stools because of the kind of obstruction there. Abdominal distension, obviously, from the backup or the backflow, and vomiting may be, in a, be occurring. So how do we diagnose it? A barium enema, basically putting barium into the colon to look for this uh, area of the bowel that has lack of nerve cells, or a biopsy can be taken in the rectum to see if the nerve cells are actually present or not. Celiac disease is, um, in the media, it's getting a lot of attention. Um, in the adult world, people tend to present with celiac disease um, when they ha and they have diarrhea, weight loss, those kind of classical symptoms that we see. However, in kids, I would tell you that, um, I'll show you a study here, that up to 30, 40 percent of them will present with constipation. So, it's something we have to keep in mind. Celiac disease runs in the family, so if there's a family history of this, uh, it's important um, to check your children as well. Basically, it's um, the inability for them to tolerate gluten, which is a protein found in wheat, rye, barley, and it ends up being a dietary modification, but a rather significant dietary modification. So certainly we would want to know that this is the diagnosis before we put the child on this kind of extreme diet. Um, what happens is, this is a picture of the small intestine and the villi are the finger-like projections. And with the celiac, because of the inflammation in the small bowel, those finger-like projections basically kind of get cut off. And so the ability to absorb nutrients and such diminishes uh, as well. So there may be some nutritional issues that actually develop over long term if this isn't treated. And this is the study I was talking to you about with constipation in celiac disease. This is a Canadian study and they um, did a survey of those patients with celiac disease. Um, 168 of them were less than 16 years old and the median age at diagnosis was three years old. And what they found in the presenting symptoms is 30 percent had constipation. So um, I would say we probably um, are more apt to check for celiac disease than any other potential medical problem that might go along with constipation because it's probably one of the more common issues. Um, the, the real issue lies in the fact that if you test a child that's not three years of age, they may have not had enough exposure to the wheat, barley, and such. and so. What happens is the tests are basically to look for antibodies that we develop against those proteins. And before three years of age, it's not clear whether kids um, might have enough antibody there to detect it in the blood. So should we check kids under three? Yes, if you have a high suspicion, but 
Um, I always caution parents that if this is really a concern, we probably need to check sometime down the road after they're three years of age, particularly if it's negative. Um, so celiac disease can be made by drawing the antibodies. It's a blood test. And then, of course, anybody that has positive antibodies, we would then proceed to do the upper scoping procedure where we go into the small bowel and take the little biopsies to look at the actual villi, the finger-like projections, um, to be sure that they're intact. That's kind of the gold standard of the diagnosis. So what are other causes, medical causes? Um, hypothyroidism. Uh, once again, this could be something that runs in your family, and if that indeed is true, you should let your physician know because that might be something to scream for. Um, they do check for thyroid in the um, newborn screening profiles, but you know, as children get into toddler school age, this may be something worthwhile looking at. Electrolyte imbalances, uh, particularly if they have a high calcium level, and that's not related to calcium that they ingest or take in. Uh, this is related to the serum calcium. High lead levels if they've been exposed. Um, problems with uh, the anatomy, meaning that the anus is um, too tight, stool can't pass very easily. Um, it's not exactly in the right spot and it might be positioned a little bit higher up than usual. Those kinds of things would be detected um, by your practitioner when they examine. Cystic fibrosis obviously can contribute to constipation or cause, and diabetes. So what do we do to manage this? Um, you know, I think the key to managing the constipation is really to uh, educate the parents, the child if they're old enough, and um, being completely honest that this problem usually has been present for years, and it's not something that we can turn around, you know, in a matter of months. It does take a lot of uh, effort. The child, as they're older and, is, and are able to cooperate, they really need to have an active role in this. Uh, parents need to facilitate it, and we need to be in close contact. Um, I had a 15-year-old boy today in clinic um, who has been to a lot of physicians, and not local, but um, from Iowa. And you know, he has suffered with constipation and, and this leak just stool in his underwear his whole life. Um, and you know, it's really sort of played a huge role. I mean, in school, it's embarrassing. He's, he's facing those issues. He's a freshman in high school. Swimming in the summer, we were talking about summer break. I mean, there's just all of those things that it impacts. So, um, you know, at his age, which is unusual to see him that late usually, but you know, to get him involved um, and actively working on this plan. So what can happen is, is that the rectum is a muscle, and the muscle tends to stretch the fibers when the stool comes into it. Um, and that's how we sense the urge we have to have a bowel movement. Unfortunately, these um, children chronically carry stool around, and their rectum is dilated. And so they oftentimes don't have good sensation of the stool being there. And therefore, they can have this leakage without even being aware of it and they may not have the urge to go. And so the, the whole goal of this treatment plan is to get the rectum back down to normal size so that once again they can sense the stool there and they can get better control over their bowel habits. So the first um, mode of management is to clean the colon out. Um, just giving Miralax or a laxative is probably not going to do it. They really need to have a good clean out where we induce diarrhea to completely get rid of all the hard wads of stool in the colon so that we can start fresh and we can start to get them going. The problem if you just start to give Miralax or a laxative and you don't do the clean out, they may have more tendency just to leak the liquid around the hard stool that's there. So you may see worsening of uh, leakage in the underwear. And typically the clean out can be used with Miralax where you give it, you know, two or three times the dose for three days to kind of promote the diarrhea or magnesium citrate, which is smaller volumes um, and tends to work quicker. We really do avoid enemas. Um, it's something we like to stay away from because it's traumatic. Uh, it's not easy for parents to do and uh, they associate it with, you know, pain. 
Then once we get beyond the clean out, we have to go to daily and we recommend Miralax. Uh, the generic Glycolax is fine, but we dose it according to weight. The reason we use Miralax is because it's safe. Um, it's, you will not develop, um, it's non-habit forming, so meaning you can use it and when you withdraw that from their uh, repertoire of meds, they're, they're not going to be dependent on that to go. Um, the goal with this is to have a stool uh, every day to every other day and we describe it as kind of a pudding consistency. Prefer no form to the stool because once they have formed to the stool, they're able to hold it again and then you kind of get back into that same pattern. So um, preferably not the stools that clog the toilet. It's good to keep them soft, but many children will tell you they have these stools that uh, make the toilet overflow. Um, the next part of the, the treatment is toilet sitting after meals. Depending upon their age, the younger kids are probably more of a five minute sit, and as you get older, maybe progressive in time. And I tell parents for the first week or two, they may not go. You, you're gonna sit them on the toilet after the meal, probably five or 10 minutes after eating. They're not, they may not go, but don't become discouraged because as we continue to give the Miralax, this is the um, most natural time for them to have a bowel movement. Uh, after we eat, our bowels are the most active. And so this would be the time that mother nature will help them have a bowel movement. I also have them keep stool calendars and um, usually just for the first few months until we get things rolling smoothly, but to keep track of when they, if they have a poop, and then to kind of document what kind of poop they're having and if they have any accidents. Uh, and if they don't poop, they also document that. And that kind of gives us an idea of what their bowel pattern is. Um, there's the whole behavioral side of management of constipation, which might be stickers or praise or whatever you might use with the calendar. But it's really good to have the child involved in that if possible. So we'd rather not pimp the toilet because the toilet should be the time to sit and you know, focus on having a bowel movement. But in the uh, era of technology, there's so many things we can do when we sit on the toilet. So I, once again, I would recommend probably uh, staying away from the other diversional activities so they can focus on what they're doing. This is an example, and there's many types of bowel records, but um, kind of just goes through the, the information that's important um, when you're looking at bowel patterns and the frequency of stools. And this is great. This is a, a chart I give to go along with the stool calendar because I, from a picture standpoint, parents and kids that are old enough can understand that, you know, the rabbit droppings type one are not good. And then I usually say type seven is like the pure liquid. That's not what we want. And then as we go through this, the type five and six are really our goal when they're on the Miralax. And um, type four is okay, but two and three are, once again, we, if your child has a tendency to withhold stool, you'll get right back into that same pattern. So what are the pitfalls? Well, we live in a busy world. We, we work outside the home. Your kids are going to school and various places. and you forget to give the Miralax or f have a hard time fitting it in. Um, the toilet sitting is so important. Uh, many times school age kids don't want to do it at school, which, you know, um, I guess they have to decide with, with their parent if that's a good idea or not. But if they're home for their evening meal, that would be a perfect time to sit on the toilet. I think, you know, that would certainly uh, suffice for that. Uh, allowing children to go days without going to the bathroom without any intervention. Um, the behavioral component may need to be addressed separately from the medical component, and we do have some uh, psychologists here specifically that deal with these issues. Um, accidents, so we clean them out, they get on the Miralax, they're doing pretty good, and in a month you start to see those accidents happening again in the underwear. That usually means that they are re-impacted with stool, and it's not unusual to have these setbacks. Uh, it's discouraging, but what we need to do is have communication to give another clean out and then proceed. Um, I would say the biggest pitfall is stopping the Miralax too soon. Nobody wants to give their kid long-term laxative therapy, but really if we would draw it any time before six months, the tendency to go back into the old bowel pattern is high, 
and usually we give it up to a year. Just depends on each individual child and how they're doing. Preventing constipation, don't let them wait to go. If you see that they got to go, you encourage them to get in there and go. Um, give them enough time so they don't feel rushed. Um, as we talked about after meals is a great time to sit on the toilet. Uh, high fiber foods, as I talked about, I think normal monofiber is good. And for babies, if you're running into the constipation issue, you might try a couple ounces of diluted juice, typically pear or apple would be the best. Um, keeping the fluids going, as we talked about the water, um, active play, being up and about, sitting on the toilet properly, meaning if they're you know, not quite tall enough to have their feet touch the floor, that you would put a little stool under there so they have support for their feet so they're able to um, properly push the stool out as they need. Um, and, you know, um, some of the other components of toilet sitting and making it not a negative thing or um, uh, a time where they have to be punished to sit on the toilet is to more of a positive thing. Eating more fiber, and I throw this in just because it gives you an idea of how to gauge how much fiber to give your child. There's a little equation here at the bottom. Your child's uh, age in years plus five grams for children older than two years of age. It gives you some kind of guideline as to where they should be. And then what are the long-term goals of our therapy? Well, obviously, we want to break this cycle of constipation. We want to get them um, sitting on the toilet, feeling comfortable with that, passing stools uh, at least every other day that are soft. We want to bring that rectum, that dilated muscle, back to a normal size so that they can feel, they can sense neurologically that they're um, uh, able to have that sensation. As we talked about the uh, goal of Miralax and using it at least six months and then the behavioral interventions if necessary. So that ends my quick whirlwind here of uh, constipation and such. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions um, that you may have. When you talk about doing the, the clean out with the Miralax, so like if you, you start them that on let's say Friday, um, yeah. How I mean, because I'm thinking I would be afraid to do that during the school week, maybe. You're right. You're, You're right. right. And I usually recommend, I mean, that parents sort of look at, especially school-age children, look at doing the clean-outs over the weekend and maybe starting them like Friday afternoon, Friday evening, and then, you know, Saturday is kind of a pooping day, and then hopefully maybe a linger, linger a little bit into Sunday, but usually it's done. Um, I would tell you I use the Miralax clean out more with the smaller children, you know, um, maybe three, four year olds that, you know, you can use it during the week. They're going to daycare. Yes, they're going to have more stools, but it's probably not a big issue. But school age children, it maybe is easier to use magnesium citrate because typically it's a two, two doses we give six hours apart and it works much more quickly. So usually within the day, you have your clean-out done. Um, although, you know, it can linger over to the next day, but typically you can get it done in a 24-hour period as opposed to several days. Magnesium citrate, is that something they drink? Yes, it's um, a magnesium um, preparation that basically induces loose stool or diarrhea. Is that the same kind of thing like people take before they have like a colonoscopy? Is it, that um, it can be used for bowel preps, yes. Okay. Um, the thing is, is um, we dose it according to their weight. You know, you wouldn't want to overdo that and cause electrolyte, potential electrolyte abnormalities in a small child. Um, and the other factor with the magnesium citrate is, is that they really need to drink a lot of fluids after they've taken their dose. Because without drinking a lot of fluids, um, it tends not to work so well. And that does come in flavored. Walgreens has grape, and you know, it's really palatable, it's easy to take. So um, kids tend to do okay with that. I have, a question. I have 21 month old twin girls, and only one of them has the issue with constipation. 
and we, I've done the Miralax with her, and I think it hasn't been for a very long time. She kind of goes through periods of where she'll, you know, she'll struggle and she, you know, she'll cry all of a sudden and kind of put on the, almost do like a push up on the ground, and she goes through these phases. And it, the Miralax helps, but I think maybe I just haven't done it for a long enough period mm -hmm. of time to really. That, yeah, that and, you know, of kind of gauge it by the stools as well, you know, to what consistency they are. Are they softer and, you know, more of a... Because, yeah, during that time she has just kind of like a... It's never like a normal diaper, you know, poopy mm -hmm. diaper. It's more of just like she's trying, but it's not, a no, you know, not... Right, right. And that's why it would be hard to kind of keep track because it's not really considered right. what I would think of a normal... Right, and especially for the smaller children like that you know, to have them looked at and make sure that the anatomy is okay. I mean, visually inspecting and, and kind of doing a rectal check and those kinds of things, I think, are yeah. is good information to have. Okay. All right. Well, um, if there's any questions that come up, uh, you can always call our clinic. Uh, I think the number may be on your handouts. And thank you for coming.